many of you think you've had the toughest year so far of all the years of being around? Show me your hands. Hmm. That's only a few of you. For the rest of you, cheer up, it's going to get worse. <laughs> now, I need to say this for the benefit of new folks who join us, the new people who come along. They say, well, supposedly when you come to the Lord and you come to church, everything gets good. And uh, I'd only say this, you know, when, when we were out in the world and we didn't understand the things of God and had no consciousness or no awareness of a greater presence, things happen, stuff happens, and you deal with it. But if you want trouble, if you really want trouble, get saved. And the minute you begin to walk with the Lord, your whole world is going to be turned upside down. Now, I'm, I'm convinced of this. I had a young man one time ask me somewhere, he said, well, are you trying to say that basically if a person, and I'm going to say it the way they said it, receives the Lord, accepts the Lord, that they can't ever fall away? And I said, I do not believe in one saved, always saved, as it's preached by some. And the reason why I don't believe that is because we, God gave us the keys to our own freedom. He gave us the ability to walk away. He gave us the ability to make mistakes. He gave us the capability to trust him implicitly, which our first father and mother, Adam and Eve, did not. He gave us the capacity to throw it away. And the record is pretty clear. After Adam and Eve, how many more threw and kept throwing those concepts away? So it's imperative that I say to the new people that come, who are coming and who are listening, there is one criteria that matters to God. Not that you be perfect, not that you walk the walk or try and walk the walk, but that you keep the faith, that you trust in Him. I'll say it again. I said it last week. You cannot have a relationship without trust. Without trust, there is no... Have you ever tried to have a relationship with somebody that you couldn't trust? Show me your hands. <laughs> can't work. It can't work. And with God, it's the same way. And He lets us stumble around finding our way until at some point, finally, we might be broken a little bit more each time. You know, when people talk about crucifying the flesh and they get some real ver verbose Christians that like to tell you how to crucify the flesh. Uh, well, you, then why don't you write a book on how to? Because for the rest of us, we're still wrestling it out. And that's the life of faith. You keep wrestling it out, and you, you are a runner in the marathon in God's book. You must cross the finish line. God does not care where you start, but it does matter how you finish. And He doesn't say, I expect you to cross the finish line shaved or looking, looking like a Christian or acting like a Christian. Just cross the finish line full of faith. That's why Paul could say, I've fought a good fight. I've agonized a good agony. I've kept the faith. So it should come to no surprise for some of you who've been around and watched me as I labor through. Oh, and I labor through. I'm just like you. I have issues to grapple with, ministry things, and a personal... Oh, and did I mention I also have a personal life, too, which can be interesting, just like you. And what I found is this the necessary faith handles to grab onto, the ones that we all seem to know so well, we need to polish, and some of them might have a little dust on them today. We need to take them off the shelf, take them to ourselves afresh, and make them look brand new again. There are no new truths in this book. And as Dr. Scott used to quote so often, I believe F.B. Meyer used to say, there are no new truths we need to rediscover the old ones. 
Now, I remember hearing Dr. Scott say you could have, um, oh, just a few things memorized in the Bible, those faith handles, and no matter what would hit you, you'd be able to make it through. Now, that's, that presupposes, by the way, that you, A, have an interest in the Word, B, that you desire to know what it is God wants you to do in those situations, and C, that you'll actually do it, which is reach into the Word and take that promise that applies to your circumstance. We've said here, if it's been said a thousand times, all the promises are ours in Christ Jesus. There isn't a promise in this book as long as you are in the faith, faithing, that are yours and mine to claim. So I decided today, because like last week I said I came preaching for me, and you got a little bit of the spillover, I think I still am needing a little bit of preaching for me, and we'll, we'll share it 50-50 today, because I think there's probably some of you who may have the same need as I do. Before I take you to the text I'm going to use, I want to read you a few things that happen consecutively in God's Word, just to tell you God's trying to say the same thing in case today, for this day, you came here like me, having had the week from hell, and mine looked like that. It may be a gross exaggeration now looking back, but it certainly felt like that while I was in it, yeah? Anybody relate? Okay, good. Because I wouldn't want to be standing up here telling that one one simple thought while I was in it, it was extremely disturbing. Now I'm looking back and thinking, eh, big deal. <laughs> I thought I was flotting, f f um, swatting at uh, big turkey vultures this week, but in fact, I'm looking back and I think they were just little mosquitoes and small pesky things, but at the time they were big for me. Now you might be in that situation today. This is why we preach. There are times we'll open the scripture and we'll do some dissecting and some taking apart and we'll go down to the minutiae. And other times it's these elements that keep us stable for the rest of the time. Now, I'm going to read you, if you came here today feeling like a God must not know or couldn't have a clue. <laughs> I want to read you a few things. I'm not even going to tell you where I'm reading from. I don't want you turning there. Oh, turn with me, because I know you will anyway. The ones who know the word, they'll be flipping the pages and it'll be... A... <laughs> Isaiah 40 and verse 20, 28 and 29 to begin with. There's three different passages I highlighted. I'm going to read them with you then as you turn there. While you turn to Isaiah 40, verse 28 and 29, I want to ask you a question. Do any of you know anybody who really has no interest in God or the things of God? Do you, anybody, anybody know anybody like that? Or, wait a minute, hands down, we'll try again. They say they're Christian. They say they're Christian, but you can't get them to get excited about God, the church, the Holy Spirit, anything relating to. It's, oh, yeah. They'll find a thousand other things. You know, you know anybody like that? Yeah. Now, if you're like me, You've probably exhausted yourself in hours of prayer and frustration and anxiety over the fact that you really believe, if you're like me, you really believe this person was put in your path or persons, that you might be the conduit, not the lasso, the conduit. <laughs> and every day or every opportunity ends with, why me, Lord? <laughs> what did I ever do? <laughs> all right. That's all I got to say about that. That was just a sidebar. I know you're, you're all at Isaiah 40 and verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, feigneth not, neither is weary, you don't have to think about if God's going to get tired and suddenly decide to nod off while you need him the most. <laughs> there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Now, I want to tell you, as I was 
preparing these scriptures to read, it suddenly dawned on me that when Dr. Scott got very, very, very sick, this was a scripture that I read to him repeatedly. Giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. And I remember him claiming that just before he came to minister to you. And it was like, almost like my, my little secret because I saw God working his work. All that was done was faith was turned loose to that promise, if that's your need. That's not my message, though. I'm just reading, and I'm giving you some background. And then I'll read again from Isaiah 41 and uh, verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness, the power that comes from God. And jump down to verse 13. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. And again, I have one more scripture I'd like to read out of Isaiah you haven't figured out, I'm really gravitated toward Isaiah. Do most of my devotionals out of Isaiah have been pulling this book apart and wonder why I didn't pull it apart sooner because it's got so many great promises in it. But Isaiah 44, and there's a few verses I'm going to read to you because they all lay the same foundation. Isaiah 44, beginning at verse 1, Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Now jump on over to verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. God's a repetitive preacher. So we're being told repeatedly, just through Isaiah's words, fear not, have courage, I'll help you, I'm going to be with you. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Now, read with me, if you will, to verse 21, because this is the one that puts all of these in context. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee, thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. And I underlined in my Bible clearly, I'm not staying with any of these texts, but I underline, thou shall not be forgotten of me, because too often, that's the state we get into. I'm the forgotten child. Now, I'm certain if I need this, you probably need it too. It seems like last week when I delivered the message to you, so many of you called and said, I need that. I sat reading the messages on the set. So many of you telling me, I've lost my job. My house is going to be foreclosed. A loved one is dying. My kids run away from home again. And I really do believe when one member hurts, the whole body hurts. The beginning of understanding of why we exist to preach God's Word is to be able to reach in, to retrain our mind. And some may say, I've heard these Bible truths for 30 plus years. It's engraved, indelible in my mind. But then I'd say to you, you need a little bit more engraving, a little bit more and a little bit more, because the fact of the matter is, the more that these things not only become second nature, but that you periodically take those same truths out again and re-examine, looking back to know, like the children of Israel, all the way the Lord has led us, protected us, guided us. You know, the times when you thought you couldn't make it, wouldn't make it. I just told you about my week from hell, and I look back and I think, now I'm looking back thinking, what, what was I doing? because I'm here. And maybe two days ago when I had no voice and couldn't speak at all, 
I was thinking, hmm, this is going to be interesting. The Lord's got to do something good for me now. Faith challenge. Well, I'm here. I've got my voice. I feel like uh, I probably kicked a couple of things along the way, getting here in good form to uh, encourage you to do likewise. If you came here kind of feeling like, well, maybe God's forgotten about me and maybe I, I don't have the courage I, I used to have. Some of you came into this church 20 and 30 years ago like Daniel. You came in and you were going to go into the lion's den. Yeah, yeah, strength like a lion. I'm, gonna, I'm like Daniel. I got the courage to go in there and face the lions. Come on, show me your hands. How many came in like that? How many of you kind of after a little while walking with the Lord? When... The tail's a little bit more tucked now, and the, the mouth isn't going so quickly anymore. So it should be of no surprise, I'm going to take off the shelf something that you should be very familiar with. We'll look at it maybe with a little bit different eyesight. Please go to Deuteronomy 33. Promise given by Moses to the tribes, and certainly I want to focus just on one verse, verse 25. Now, let me give you a little background about something. You, some of you have come to know me real well, and no matter what I do, even if it's revisiting an old familiar passage, I always go into the Hebrew, and I like whatever it is we're studying, and I'll check out the translation just to make sure. And this one has, um, has an interesting history, if you'll indulge me before I get into the, the meat of the message. This has an interesting history to it. Um, if you're reading, some of you have been here a long time and may or may not know the problems of translation with this verse. From the 26th translation, some translators translated this very Deuteronomy 33:25, "Iron and bronze be thy sandals, thy bars shall be iron and brass. May your door bolts be iron and copper." Yeah, that's. I could I could do something with that. I could do something with that. Um, let me stop there and let me just say a few words that are interesting regarding the Hebrew. As most of you know, because we do, and I still collect manuscripts and know much of the history of, of the Hebrew text, much of what we have today from the Hebrew is out of the Masoretic text. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls to refer to, but much of what we use is from the Masoretic text, which it was from those, that group of scholars, uh, the Kairites and uh, some of those scribes and priests, that the vowel pointing, what is called the diacritical marks in Hebrew, were added at a much later time. So if we were to go way back to the Dead Sea Scrolls and look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have no vowel markings on them. So pronunciation could be ambiguous because the whole Hebrew system, its language is all consonants. And so essentially they derive their vowels by putting dots. You've seen the dots and the lines underneath the words, so then pronunciation is clear. But we know that we had this text as uh, perhaps Moses scribed this book. There were no vowel points. So when people say, well, how come, how come there's a difference between what the King James says, thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and all these other translations. In fact, mine has a little footnote, under thy shoes shall be iron and brass. And we've had the message, most of us, I think, didn't end our brains. Our shoes will be iron and brass. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. There's so much uh, confusion amongst the scholars. Here's from the Targum Pseudo-Jonathan Deuteronomy from uh, the Ara Aramaic Bible Collection. Actually, I have a Targum. I didn't think it was necessary to bring it and drag it in here to show you. I think reading from a book would suffice for most of you. Uh, but they translated it this way. Understand that there's going to be some discrepancy. They, they translated it this way. The tribe of Asher is as bright as iron and their feet as hard as bronze to walk upon the sharp points of the rocks. Okay? And if you really want to get interesting, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with the uh, Septuagint, which is that Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew, second, third century before Christ, if you will, that really probably gives the closest that I can, I can find in my research, which really does let you actually say it is shoes, whether people want to nitpick. I just thought I'd tell you, some of you say, well, why'd they say that? The, the, the uh, Septuagint version says, his sandal shall be iron and brass. And I'm, I'm going to stick with that. I'm going I'm to say shoes, shoes of iron and brass. But did any of you ever stop to think about in the Bible? I mean, just think about this, that metals, just like colors and numbers, have um, meaning. And the Hebrew word for brass, I'm sorry, the Hebrew word for, for iron, sounds like this, barzel. If you know your scripture, you know that man barzillia, man of iron. So it gives you the picture. If you don't go too strongly into irons and their composition, uh, it gives you the impression of strength, something to be uh, given for endurance. And the bronze, which usually sometimes can be used for judgment, but the same word appears in the Hebrew, is the same root as, listen closely, nehushta. Sounds a little bit like nehushtan, right? That bronze serpent. So you can kind of get a, a picture. We've never stopped to identify these two concepts, but I think in this case, because it's a promise and it's not a curse, as some might, might have interpreted it, although walking around with big shoes like that could be a curse, but, or considered that way if you're a fashion expert. But certainly the idea behind this is obviously those shoes of iron, shoes, not only I think shoes of iron, but, but your walk, strengthened walk, whatever it is you're going to endure, God will give you the strength through these shoes. Now we're shod, the New Testament says we're shod with the gospel of peace. So I find no stretch, no, no big chasms to cross over in terms of this text. And when it comes to the translation of shoes, uh, as I said, I'm going to stick with that, and there's, there's a good reason why. This, it's a one-hit uh, word in the Hebrew that occurs just here for shoes, and that's the complication. They put vowel marks under it, so no one can understand what it means. I'm going to stay with shoes. I'd hate for it to be translated sandals, though, because sandals of iron and brass would kind of be like a... You know, somebody will come up with a workout machine like that and be like, hey, God was cutting edge here. All right. All right, then. But so many times as we've woven through this message, and I think I haven't touched on this scripture probably for two years, because quite frankly, I think I, that's the one part of the message I've understood. God's going to give me the means and the capacity to go through. And I think probably I just start, the tank just started to run a little bit on empty. As I, and that's good, because that's when you know when you're empty, that's when you know that God can fill you up again. And I, I went back to this promise and I said, you know, this carried me through some pretty tough times when I didn't think I could make it, but I knew that God wouldn't put me in a position that I couldn't make it. That's why I start off by asking you, how many of you had a, a bad week where you might have thought, I can't take any more of this? I just, come on, let me see your hands. I can't take any more of this. And God said, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> I've equipped you. Now, listen, to me, the whole point of coming into this building is for you to get your batteries recharged in the faith. Because some of us are a little bit more worn out from the week, and others maybe came in here and you felt really good. You woke up this morning saying, I feel great. Well, good for you. We'll be praying for you for the later part of your day. <laughs> you know, I, I think about people in the Bible who, although we don't hear them telling us this promise, shoes of iron and brass, but I think of David when he said, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil. God's tokens accompany me. Thy staff, thy rod, and thy staff, they're, they're with me. You know, you can take this and make this just some, uh, as I've said many times, Sunday school lesson. You never apply it. Do you, do you ever get to the point right now where you say, you know, all the stuff that I imputed in my brain when I was listening to Dr. Scott and he would repeat certain things, at some point after the repetition is so strong, you say, I, 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 finally, I finally get it. It's taken me this long. I had a moment like that a couple of years back. It took me this long to get this one concept. You can never hear something enough. You can never be reminded enough because your situation, as you may think it's so unique to you, God's already seen it. God's already seen your weak. God saw your anxiety. And I, as I told you, I sat on the set and I read those messages of some folks saying, I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how we're going to make it through our situation. And it's so easy to do that. We're human, but it's so easy to do this. It's so easy to go back to counting the pennies. Where can we buy bread? To, to counting the pennies, to forgetting the fishes and the loaves were multiplied by the master. It's so easy to go back into the penny count. How many know that? It's easy to go back in the penny counting mode. We're just, well, we don't have enough money to buy bread. I mean, Jesus is crazy here. How much money you got? How much money you got? Oh, okay. Well, we don't have enough money. Look at all these people. And we do that. I have people sitting in front of me right now. Their situation for anybody else, probably, and I say this, and you might say it's slightly pompous of me, but in any other church, not as well taught as you, would be broke. I mean, their back would have broken a long time ago. There are people sitting right here in front of me who I know your circumstances. Some of the most faithful king's house is sitting out there watching. And because I'm, I keep up on who's doing what and how they're feeling and where they're going in their life, because you're calling in and telling me, there's a time where you have to just kind of park all the other stuff and say, wait a minute, I need to get a new fix because the same God that led me through those other problems and those other crises and those other things that I, I survived them. Not only did I survive them, I, I came out better. Although while I was going through it, I, I didn't think that was possible to be quite frank with you. But I survived them. The promise to you and to me, shoes, Tough enough for the trip. Now, I can barely, I don't want to leave this just yet because I have the perfect example for some of you that were around that you'll really relate to. How many of you remember, um, I've got to find if she's in, sitting in front of me somewhere. How many of you remember, I had Sylvia resole my shoes. You remember that? Yes, yeah. Remember she put those tractor? <laughs> and I, I really thought at that moment, she, by God, she got it. She, she probably knew it was going to be a tough road for me. She got my so shoes resold, and the soles of those shoes were like work boots. They were like construction boots. Remember that? And walk around, they were really big. <laughs> All right. But I always think of that. Every time I read this passage, I always think about that, that somebody around me, now I don't think that she got them sold like that deliberately, but somebody around me, <laughs> it's okay, I still love you. You know, I, didn't, I couldn't see where she was until she laughed and covered her mouth, and I, I recognized the laugh. That's her. Don't look, everybody. <laughs> but somebody around me knew that would be sufficient for those shoes. They thought I needed that type of shotting. Pointing to the feet, yes, in case I'm, somebody takes that out of context. And all I got to say is those shoes didn't wear out. At least the bottoms didn't. <laughs> the rest of the shoe did. All I was left with was bottoms and a little bit of leather on the top. <laughs> Tough shoes, they were. Tough shoes, they, and they, they were good shoes. 
What I'm telling you, though, is that God gives us enough to get us through. Now, you know, this type of a promise can be taken, and we go by it real quick. You heard it before, and you say, yeah, okay. Well, let me give you the second part. The second part kind of annoys me, because it says, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Let's see if I can do this on my tablet here. Uh, yeah, we'll do it like this. And I'm going to write out the Hebrew of two words I want you to see, because they're rather simple, but they'll show you why I don't want this to be some far removed. All right, so that's one, and then word number two. This is like a graffiti. I get to write on things, and all right, here we go. I want to give you a quick, won't be a big language lesson, but I'll give you a quick glimpse at something. And, Vav conjunction, and, as, or like, as, or like. We're going to use as, and is your conjunction for the Hebrew. And you see here, yom, and I want you to look at this one. If you, if you forget everything else about what I'm doing, just remember this one thing. The end of this Hebrew word, and as days, of you. And I want you to just see this. This is the long form ending of ka, k, ka, and this, what looks like a t, is actually an a, it's a vowel. When I refer to the diacritical marks. And as days of you, I, I know the King James was translated at a time where these and thy and thou, and I love that, but I want you to make it, this isn't this isn't fudging anything. This is making it yours because it says, and as, or like, the days of you. They are your days. They're not somebody else's days. They're your days. And there's no conjunction here. And da, da ve ika. That is the strength, again, of you. So, as your days, plural, days of you, they are your days, strength of you. And I wanted to show that deliberately for a reason, because every time I've read that in the scripture, thy days, thy strength, it's still, even though I know it's old English, it sounds far removed. And when I looked at the Hebrew, it's, it's my days, it's the days of me. And God knows the days of me. He says the days, he, he allots those days, whatever they are. And I believe the writer and Moses, the speaker, put those as plural to suggest it's not a one-hit wonder. It's not a one-time event. That God knows just what you need for every single day of your life. That that promise to me shouldn't just be in a little cubby hole like I woke up today and I'm feeling sick so it's not going to be that bad of a day. Well that may be true for today but it says days which spans the time of my life and my journey here on earth. Now a lot of people get disturbed about this because we have this propensity to want to ask God for the long-term thing. You know it's not enough to ask God for days and strength for the days. It's like wanting to ask God, God, instead of you fixing this one thing over here, can you just give me a good chunk? Give me a good month. You know? <laughs> you ever been on those windy roads, mountainous windy roads, and you can't see around the corner? And you know as well as I do that if an engineer, uh-oh, if an engineer could have planned something better instead of winding roads, we'd have just straightened the road and made a straight angle. I'd take the straight road because you can't see what's coming around the bend. But here's this beautiful picture. God is saying, don't ask me to straighten out the road. Don't ask me to uh, give you big chunks. I'm going to take care of your days and your span, and I'm going to give you the strength to handle what's coming around the bend. Now, you know, if you don't need this message today, 
good. I'm glad. I'm good for you. But I know for me, I can spend a lot of time in the Word trying to do a lot of what I call a combination of um, homiletical and, and uh, trying to divide up the Word, doing translation, and get so deeply into one place over here that this other place gets neglected. It's my responsibility to come to you and say, this is the faith injection you need. You can't make it in your own strengths. That's the other tendency to forget that it's, it's, it's not about your capacity. God's going to enable you. Now, I, I'm, I'm sure of this. Just as Jesus, before he ascended, raised his hands, blessed the people, blessed his disciples and ascended, and in that time space where he disappeared, but he told them to tarry at Jerusalem, what type of anxiety must they have been feeling in waiting for him? Because there was something uncertain. They did not know, but God knew it. God sent a promise, and he made good on it. So a lot of times we spend our time like that. We don't know, although we do. We just can't see it yet. Same thing with Moses. Moses is now up on the mountain. He's blessing the people. God wasn't so kind. Of, well, maybe he was. He said, you could peek over the promised land, but you can't go in. And then after you're done doing this, you get up to Mount Nebo and die. Thanks, God. 120 years of leading and moving around, and that's, that's the last word. Get up in Mount Nebo and die. What's the last act that Moses does? Blesses the people. And this blessing is contained there. And I'm thinking to myself, before Joshua is now leading the pack, there had to be a moment of anxiety. I always put flesh and blood on all these things. I think to myself, I remember back to the day when I came and asked you to pray for Dr. Scott as he was in a coma. And there must have been great anxiety, not knowing there was this uncertainty, the anxiety of what's going to happen. Now, please don't tell me you didn't sit in the church, even though I came and I tried to be encouraging, that most of you didn't say, what's going to happen now? How's this going to work out? Because the first thing the mind does is it latches on to, if there's just a little bit of doubt, if there's just a little bit of anxiety, and we create a factory, we're great at this. We have a trouble factory in our brain. It's not enough. We're not happy enough to just deal with the things and process the things that come at us naturally in life. We have to manufacture some more. <laughs> How's this going to work out? Is this going to be OK? What, what's the game plan? What are we going to do? Now, it doesn't always happen this way. Our first reaction isn't, the Lord's in control. God's going to take care of it. Tell me, why did Jesus tell the disciples to pray? When you pray, give us this day our daily bread. Why didn't he say, when you pray, give us our weekly bread? <laughs> why ask for daily bread? That's kind of silly. Just go to the store once a week. Lord, give me my weekly bread, please. <laughs> because the same lesson Jesus was teaching the disciples, God, way back there, taught the children of Israel with the manna. Enough bread, enough manna for each day. Sufficient for each day. Oh, you know what? Some of you are sitting here and saying, I know the lesson, I got it, I've practiced it. And then my next question to you will be, when was the last time you had a moment of panic and anxiety hit you? And then it doesn't matter how many times you've heard the lesson. You're back at square one. Oh, how's this going to work out? How's this going to... Oh. You know, it, it does not matter how many times, and I've, I've really come to appreciate this. It does not matter how many times I've heard the lesson, that I know it in my heart. And that's why I have great sympathy. I mentioned those folks who you can't get them interested in the things of God, even though they say they're Christians, because how on earth, and that is exactly it, how on earth do you expect to make it into heaven as a child of God not even knowing the basic principles. If you don't care enough to know about what your Heavenly Father has for you in store as promises, you won't even take them off the shelf, dust them off, and start using them. But talk to me about the mansions in the sky, or at least make sure I get a little cabin somewhere. 
You get what I'm saying? There's, there's, there's too much for me, and I'm, I, believe me, I'm experiencing enough of it in my, in my uh, Christian living. There's too many folks out there walking around saying, oh, I love Jesus. Jesus is Lord. And this is probably going to shock some of you. Because I don't believe in interfering in your life. I live your life, faith. And if you're faithing in Christ, believe me, he's going to change you. Some of these, you cannot get them to come into the church or to open up a Bible. And God forbid you should ask them about a, a person in the Bible. They always refer to it as a little story. Oh, that little story. You know people like that? Well, that's a good little Bible story. And I get, that's where I get mad. Do you want to know what makes me mad? That, that makes me mad. And people say, oh, that, that little story about Daniel. Well, Daniel was a real pious guy, and he prayed good, but, you know, and it's, it's, in my mind, they still view it as a caricature. It's a cartoon. It's, a, it's, it's something that's not reality, when in fact God has given us this drama and said, if you look to this, I've given you every single solution for every single promise you face. If you'll just faith and trust me at my word, I'll see you through. I'm the enough God. But you'd have to try him first. <laughs> so we have the first part of this promise. Shoes tough enough for the trip. The second part of this, personalize it for you. I've done it for me as the days of me, as my days, my strength. That means I should have a pretty easy day today, right? Pretty easy day. We'll see. We'll see what God has in store. Now, I wasn't going to go there, but I think I was going to stay on verse 25, but I think I'm going to jump down because I did bring something I wanted to share with you. Um, I'm going to jump down to that 27th verse. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And I want to share something with you, because I remember the last time I taught on this. I, rem I distinctly remember when I taught on this. And I was going through some pretty nasty events in my life. I had people that were just absolute determined imps from hell that they could do some malice to me and, uh, you know, make me make my knees get weak or something. And I remember preaching out of this. I remember preaching it at the cathedral. I think it was in the month of December, sometime around there. I remember preaching on this and thinking to myself, you know what? No matter how far, how far I may feel like I'm falling, God's already there, and I'm not, I'm not in danger because I know where I've placed my trust. I haven't placed my trust in mammon, I haven't placed my trust in somebody else. I've placed my trust in him. And I remember the peace that came over me was so great that it didn't bother me. And in fact, I've told you this, the lesson that came out of those years made me a better person in Christ because I learned the lessons. You know, it's tough when you have been wronged by people to understand what it means to forgive people, even if they don't deserve to be forgiven, then I'd ask the question, who does deserve to be forgiven? Who in God's presence deserves forgiveness? So, so many great lessons personally came out of this time that this particular message became a salve to my soul. So, she was tough enough for the trip. As my days, strength enough for the days, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Now, you remember, and I know you do because you've heard it a bazillion times, Dr. Scott used to talk about that parade in terms of time as a parade. How many of you remember that? Now, I could have brought from any particular person whose uh, sermons are put down on paper, but Dr. Scott used to reference G. Campbell Morgan. And there's many, many, I can tell you, uh, uh, Spurgeon and uh, all of the giants, they all preached a message from this text using similar uh, concepts from the idea of time as a parade where God's on the corner before you get there. I thought I'd read you just a small snippet of Morgan's 
uh, concept and uh, familiar pattern of putting this together because if there is no time with God, and we know that because God does not wear a watch, never. <laughs> but if there is no time with God, He is the God of, just like we read in the New Testament, He's the Alpha and the Omega. You know, that's why I said I don't believe in the wind-up toy event for the Christian. I do believe God gives us the capacity to go off the track, sometimes deliberately even, to teach us, to break us, to make us, to rebuild us, to refocus us. But from that depiction of no time with God, I love what Morgan has to say. And I'm reading from the Westminster pulpit. We always give credit to uh, G. Campbell Morgan. And the message is the faith that cancels fear. And it says, fasten... Well, I'll start from the beginning here. It says... We are ever prone in our thinking of tomorrow to think, to think of it as being in front of us. Tomorrow is not in front of us. Tomorrow is behind us. These are the latter days, and the earlier days are gone. Tomorrow is still later. In other words, the whole underlying suggestion is that of a great procession, a parade. Fasten your attention for a moment on some great procession you've seen pass along the highway. The beginning of the procession is always in front, the end of it is always behind. Yesterday is in front. Tomorrow is behind. The whole history of humanity is a procession. And in the beginning is God leading the procession. And we are not moving away from those who went before us as though we dropped them somewhere behind and left them. We don't, that's the way we think. We're moving after them. We're following after them. The generation that shall be born will not be born in advance of us. They will be behind us. God leads and accompanies. He is the God of the morning, of the beginning, and He is thy dwelling place. And I thought, you know, echoes of that idea that I've heard and you've heard as time as a parade. In Dr. Scott's case, he used to reference the, the parade which they used to be able to see from where they lived. That Rose Bowl, Rose Bowl parade that used to come by. And I liked the idea of the parade. I couldn't really wrap my mind around the fact as I'd sat many times and watched parades pass me by. But the fact of the matter is I had really envisioned that as God is the first goer. He's already ahead. And that which came before is already gone. And that which is behind is yet to come. So anything with this promise lets me know it doesn't matter what's coming down the road. God's already got it covered for me. Yeah, I, I know, Pastor. I know that. Well, then, why be anxious? That's why I need to be reminded. It's real easy to get into the, that mindset that says, well, I know God will be on the corner before I get there. Your mouth is saying that. I believe. Help my unbelief. I really believe God's going to be on the corner before I get there. Oh, what do I do now? <laughs> you know what I mean? We've all done that. By the way, it's not, it's not a crime. We've all done that. And by the way, it's better to open your mouth and claim a promise like that. The missing ingredient has to be a claim it with full faith that God will hasten his word to perform it. Now, I don't know about you, but I know for me, this is the big one. Because with God as my refuge, it doesn't matter what's hitting in my life, what type of storm is going on. Sickness. No, this will pass. You know me, I, I'm, I'm here. I felt really good just to be here. And then I'll probably fade out a little bit this afternoon and say, wow, that was a good hour I had. I felt really good. You should have seen me yesterday. <laughs> My refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. You know, he'd have to have everlasting arms. If he gave you tough shoes for a tough trip and they're iron and brass, he'd have to have everlasting arms to catch you when you fall. That'll, that'll hit you in a minute. I have really, I want you to know this. I'm going to give you some personal background here. I'm very intolerant of people thinking Christianity is easy. It's not easy. And I'm not standing here like some child. I'm telling you like somebody who's walked through enough Storms. <laughs> I 
to tell you, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You know, there's enough of you sitting seasoned warriors in front of me. I don't need to. It's the new people I worry about. The new people that come, and they come like those in the parable of the sower. They're so eager to hear, and they want to receive the word, and then when trouble comes, they can't take it. They leave. I'm telling you as a congregation, I'm telling you as individuals, I'm telling you friends, brothers and sisters in the Lord, some of you who are just coming to walk with the Lord through this ministry, You better be putting on those shoes. God's given a promise. You better put them on. Don't be crying afterwards. Lord, Lord, it was good. (laughs) But didn't didn't I just tell you about a promise? And that's just one of how many that are in this book? I've become intolerant with people who don't want to face the harsh reality that Christianity requires. It is a prerequisite. You want to get to that resurrected life, pick up your cross. And the last time I checked, cross-carrying does not consist of carnival barking, fun and amusement. It's hard work, and it's the work of a loving child who knows by, by carrying my own cross. You carry yours, I'll carry mine. God sees. And because he sees me picking up my own load, he lightens it. Too much of that, that's it. Too much of Christianity wants you to carry their load so they can sit back with their feet up and, okay, come on now, move me. I don't want to be moving people unless you understand what your responsibility is. It's not going to be easy. I can tell you standing here, and I don't need to say calling any witnesses to bear this fact. I've had more sick days in six plus years than probably all the years that came before. Why is that? Hmm. I've had more obstacles put in the road in the last six years, personally. I've had more personal attacks and more people. You just name it. Now listen to me. All of these things I've just chronicled to you, the Apostle Paul chronicled too, and he said, Now let neither sickness nor nakedness nor peril of sword, peril of death, any of these things, what and who shall separate us? from the love of Christ, and ask you the same thing today. What type of anxiety are you facing that you can't reach into this book today and say, you know what, this promise is mine. God's going to equip me. He already has enough for the day, given me special traveling mercies, shoes made of iron and brass. That's extra strength with the knowledge that, listen, you don't put on those, and I envision what those shoes could look like. I have a great imagination. Picture Harley boots on steroids. <laughs> okay. Now they're spiritual boots. And they're not made to uh, look glamorous. They're not made to wear in the boudoir. Or wherever you might think you might want to wear them. They're meant for your Christian walk. Tough shoes for a tough trip. Okay. And as my days, strength. So you don't have to worry about asking God, God, give me a double dose, because believe you me, when you wake up feeling like you have a double dose of strength, God's going to make sure you have a double dose day. (laughs) And the eternal God, the God of the forefront, the God that's on the corner before you get there is your refuge. Don't Be anxious. Why do you think Jesus said, don't be anxious, take no thought? You know how hard that is? He's talking to his disciples. He's going to send them out. He says, take no thought for what you're going to eat or or, or drink, or where you're going to sleep. Huh? What kind of talk is that? Can you imagine telling a church today, take no thought of what you're going to eat or drink or where you're going to sleep? People say, Pastor, that's not going to work. (laughs) It's popular Christianity today. The Lord, the Lord would provide in the case of the disciples. And I'm saying to you right here, for us right now, don't be anxious about tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, you're still going to have to wake up and face tomorrow, and you're going to have wasted all the energy today on tomorrow, which hasn't yet come yet anyway, but will. (laughs) So let me ask you, 
And I pray for you, you'll take this promise, and if you had it set on a shelf or you put it away, or you say, yeah, I've heard it, that you'll take it again today, that whatever you're anxious over, God's already got it covered. Whatever you're facing tomorrow or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, why does he say, as your days, plural, that means a whole week, but you don't get it all in advance, you get it day by day. God knows how to meet out the strength and give you the infusion that you need to get by. And by the way, the best part of this promise is you won't be able to claim it until you know that you as a weak vessel and myself as a weak vessel need his strength, need his provision, need his hand to accompany me. That's why I started in those promises out of Isaiah 40, 41, and so forth. Because the last one resonated with me. God said, I haven't forgotten about you. Friends, God hasn't forgotten about you. He gave you a promise, gave it to me and to you, to not be anxious, but to know God's in control. So I pray you'll take this promise afresh today, and like that manna that the children of Israel gathered, you'll take it for the day, sufficient for today. And if you're not feeling too good or too strong or you're feeling kind of weak, Thank the Lord and say, at least I have another day. Gave me enough strength, gave me enough to get here. Given you whatever you need, and that's the promise for us. No more, no less, but tough enough. Those uh, promises, these shoes, and the words I've spoken to you, tough enough to make the trip. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.